How's everybody doing? It's kind of it's kind of weird coming up after that. I kind of want to start dancing or something. Um, hey, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible, a Connect team is going to come down and raise your hand. They'll give you a copy of God's Word. You can keep that copy and take it home today and read it. As Ronnie said, read it every day, right? And take it home and keep it as a gift from us to you. Um, I am so honored and privileged and excited to be able to preach today. Um, I thank Pastor Rob so much um, for the opportunity to just stand here and just to present the truth of God's Word to you. And also, I want to thank all the other pastors, Pastor Dustin and Brick and Robert. Uh, we're so thankful that Rob and, and Robert get a little bit of rest, and we'll be back with us very soon. And I'm just very honored to be here. My name is Matthew Weaver, by the way, if I haven't met you yet. I'd love to meet you, and I'm the uh, campus host here and oversee our Connect ministry at Vintage, and I'd love to just meet you and get to know you. And so uh, I'm excited today. Uh, today's topic is connection. Connection. And for some of you today, you might be thinking, uh, everybody's wired differently, right? Ronnie Marie, what a great testimony this morning of, of a married couple, of one of them being extroverted, extreme, and one being introverted, extreme. And for me, that's awesome because I know that God has wired each and every one of us in a very specific way, right? If everybody was extroverts, this world would be a very annoying place. <laughs> Anybody agree? And if everybody was introverted, it'd be extremely awkward. Nobody would talk to each other. And so God was pretty smart and wise when he decided to create personalities and to wire everyone differently. And so it's really remarkable when you think about it. In this topic of connection today, I want you to just think about, you know, take a step back and think about who has God created you to be? How are you wired? How, how are you, what's your personality like? How do you relate to people? What's the way that you present yourself? And today, my challenge for you as we leave, as we dive into God's Word, my challenge for you today is, is as you leave, take one step forward in obedience. One step forward in obedience, according to the way God has created you. According to the way God has created you. Luke chapter 14 is our text, <clears throat> verse 16 through 24. And today we're going to talk about connection. I'm really excited to share this parable with you in the book of Luke. And as we go through this, this parable and we, we divide the text and pull out application, I want you to know everything is going to be on the screen, and it's also going to be related to V-groups. If you're new to Vintage, if it's your first time here, we're so glad you're here. I want to explain to you what a V-group is. You might be thinking, is that Sunday school? Is that Bible study? We're just kind of trendy like that. So um, V-groups are a group of 10 to 20 people who gather throughout the city for transformation, connection, and multiplication, specifically to grow together in community in God's word and to be there for each other. That is our form of discipleship in small groups. And so if you're not in a V group today, you have a great opportunity to investigate. And so as we dive into the word, I'm going to relate V groups to every point. And so community is essential and it's God's heart. We'll see this in Luke chapter 14. Let's read verses 16 through 24. I'll read it out loud for us. Luke chapter 14. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field. I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I must go examine them. Please have me excused as well. Another said, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So the servant came, he reported all of these things to his master, and then the master of the house became angry, and he said to his servant, he said, go out quickly, go to the streets and go to the lanes of the city, bring in the poor, bring in the crippled, bring in the blind, and bring in the lame. The servant then said, sir, what you've commanded has already been done, and there's still room. The master then said to the servant, go out to the highways, go to the hedges, compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. 
For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. We're all extremely broken and aware of what's happened this week. In Baton Rouge and in, uh, in Dallas and other parts of our country, uh, what, a, what a just a tragic week. And as I began to prepare for this message and, and began to look at, at this, this concept of the kingdom of God. So today we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. And it might be hard for you. You walked in today. I don't know what you're going through. Everybody's going through stuff. Everybody's going through stuff. But you walked in today with some kind of burden. And it very well could be what's happened this week. It's affecting all of us. We should all be broken. We should all be devastated and pleading with God for God to heal this land. But I, I read this article that one of our pastors sent me. It's a guy named Russell Moore. Uh, Russell Moore is a leader in the convention that we partner with here at Vintage. And he's an incredible leader in our country. Very spoken Christian leader. Very involved in what's going on. And this article that was sent to me was just wrote, and Russell Moore wrote this to address pastors and preachers that would be preaching today. You know, it's tough to get up and preach about something when you know that something happened the week before. Do I mention that? Do I not mention that? It's kind of, you know, it's kind of a touchy situation. But this article really encouraged me, and I wanted to share part of it with you today and relate that to the kingdom of God. This is just one section of the article. Let's listen closely, because this has very strong relevance for all of us. A week filled with violence will shake people. It can remind them of their mortality. Such a week will also remind them of the persistence of sin, both individual and corporate, in the fallen world around us. Our sense of outrage at injustice can remind us that our sense of justice points beyond us to the judgment seat of Christ. Remind people then, remind people then that they are created in the image of God and they are loved by Him. Call people. Call people to see that their secret sins are not secret. They will be exposed at judgment. Warn people. Warn people that life is fleeting. Point people to Jesus Christ, who lived out the life we cannot live. Bore in His body the judgment of our sin and was raised from the power of death. Offer the gospel as the only word that can reconcile us to God and to each other. When I read that, I began to think, what is the cure for all this, you know? And as we look at the kingdom of God, it has huge implications for our lives. And it is here and now, and there is hope. There is hope today. I want to dive into this text with you today. Before we do that, I want to lay out some context for you. In this situation, Jesus is dining at a Pharisee's house. If you know anything about the Bible, um, about this time period, Pharisees and Jews didn't really hang out. Um, very separate, very isolated, and very just living separate lives, don't associate with each other, right? It could be maybe sort of like us today in Metairie going to uh, Uptown or something, right? Maybe not? Okay, I tried. Um, just some division. And Jesus sits down at this Pharisee's house. He's on the way to Jerusalem, and he's responding to a man's comment. Here's what the man says. It's actually in verse 15. The man says, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of God. Blessed is everyone. And what that is is a metaphor for the eternal life that's to come in heaven. This man was only focused on the future. He lost sight of the present. The kingdom of God is not something we just long for for heaven. It has implications right now. And so Jesus addresses this about the kingdom of God, and he goes into a parable. First thing, I have one question for you to, well, to uh, give you the answer for, actually. Uh, the first question is, what is, the, what is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of God? Here's a simple answer. It's on the screen behind me. The kingdom of God is the rule and the reign of God. It's past, present, and future. The kingdom of God is past, present, and future. It's when God ruled in Genesis chapter 1, when he created the heavens and the earth. It's when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and it's when Jesus is coming back again. 
It's the entire picture of Jesus and God's reign in our lives. Question number two. As we dive into this text, you might have noticed it's a parable. You might be wondering, what is a parable? Here's what a parable is. A parable is an illustrative story by which a familiar idea is cast beside an unfamiliar idea in such a way that the comparison helps people better understand and grasp the unfamiliar idea. I know that's a lot of words, but let me translate that. Basically, Jesus met people where they were, and he was very creative. He got down on this level and looked at people, and he served them. And so Jesus, when he tells stories in the Gospels, you'll notice that he's relating to people and telling it in a way that people can understand, which is incredible to me. Jesus is creative, right? Here's what I want to do today, guys, as we dive in together. The first thing, I want you to just take note of this. As you walked in, you had these, these cards. Hopefully, most of you have them. Uh, If you don't, there's some outside on your way out the door. This is the Lord's Prayer. Okay, and I want you to just take this home, and I want you to think about the kingdom of God when you see this. Let me read it to you. Let's actually read it together, actually, starting from uh, the very first verse. Let's read it together. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I put this on your seats today because I want you to realize that Jesus prays the prayer that we need the kingdom now. We need our daily bread, not our future bread. We need both breads. If we don't have hope in the future, there's no hope for the present. But praise God that there's hope in the present, because there's also hope for the future. And so the kingdom of God is right now in this room happening all around you. It's today. I want to point out three things today for you. If you're taking notes, it'll be on the screen behind me. Three implications that the kingdom of God has in your life in order for you to be in connection with other people. Three implications for you today about the kingdom of God. The first one. The kingdom is available. The kingdom is available. Verses 16 through 17. He said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. At the time for the banquet, he sent his servants to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. In this situation, in this time period, invites were sent out way in advance. People knew about this feast. It's not like it was last minute. They had it on their calendar. They knew about it. The table said the invites were ready. Everything is prepared. The feast is there. The Jews were the original ones invited to this feast. The table was set. Everything was ready. I want you to take away these three action points under this, the availability of the kingdom. Um, John McCann, who's our campus host at Uptown Arts Center, he helped me with these. He's much more creative than me. And, uh, you know, our pastor loves to use alliteration, right? Pastor Rob, you know, start everything with the same letter. And uh, we didn't force these points, don't worry. They actually make sense. And so, uh, not that Rob does that either, by the way. He doesn't do that. Um, These points are relevant. And so, John helped me with these. And we came up with three sub-points of action for knowing that the kingdom is available. The first point. The first point is you have to acknowledge it. You have to acknowledge it. Now, I recognize today that there's two types of people in this room. We say this all the time at Vintage. There's believers and non-believers. There's people that know and love Jesus and have put their faith and trust in Jesus. And there's people that don't know Jesus. And they've never had that repentance of that 180 of sprinting away from sin and running towards the cross. There's two types of people. That's it. Revelation says there's no one lukewarm. Jesus does not like the lukewarm heart. He'll spit you out of his mouth is what he says. That's unacceptable. So it's either believer or non-believer. And so when I say acknowledge it, I want you to think, where are you today? Are you a believer and you just need to remind yourself that God is here and present? Or are you a non-believer needing to recognize your need for the gospel? Because it is there and it's now. It's available for you. You have to acknowledge it. The second thing is you have to access it. You have to access it. The kingdom is set out. The feast is ready. 
What are you going to do with it? Non-believer, today, those that don't know Jesus, I plead and pray that you would consider giving your life to Jesus. Will you give your life to Jesus? That's my question for you today in accessing the kingdom is will you surrender and repent and trust Jesus? And for the Christian today, will you continue to play your part in the kingdom? Everybody's wired differently, right? That's what I love about the church. Not everybody's the same. We can all be different. I'm looking around today. Everybody's dressed differently. Everybody's looking at me weird in different ways. Um, And so everybody's different, right? And so everybody has a different part to play. Nobody plays the same part. Nobody does. You have a very specific design for your part in the kingdom. And so will you continue or will you play your part in the kingdom? The third thing about the kingdom being available is you need to appreciate it. Does anybody appreciate it? Come on, anybody. Thank you. The nine o'clock was a little more lively than that. It's okay. You've got to appreciate the kingdom of God. Give thanks in all circumstances. Appreciate that God has, has given you access to eternal life through Jesus. Appreciate it. I'm going to lose my voice. I'm only on point one. Appreciate it. So my family is super spread out. I live here. My parents live in Georgia, where I was born and raised. My sister's in North Carolina. I could not be more, you know, I guess I could be farther away, but we're all just everywhere. And so we have so many great memories together, so many great things we've done together. I'm so thankful for my family in so many ways. But one memory that I have over and over again of my family is eating uh, meals together and gathering together to sit down at a table and enjoying a feast that my mom always makes. And uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what she makes, I'm from Georgia, not Louisiana. So we do eat biscuits and gravy, um, cornflake chicken. Um, you say it, we eat it, right? Bacon, anything that's, that's nice and Cracker Barrel style. And that's, that's what I grew up on. And I love that stuff. And I still love it. And I will pick it over um, seafood oftentimes. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but that's what we grew up on. And so we would gather as a family. We'd eat. We'd sit down. But I have a picture in my mind as I read this passage thinking about the kingdom being available and just like not waiting for the kingdom to be available, or not waiting to access it, but to go, I thought about our meals together, and I thought about moments where my sister and my mom were in the kitchen getting things ready, right? And the guys were in the den watching golf or football. Dad was propped up on the lazy boy, you know. I'm sitting somewhere on the couch. My grandpa's falling asleep somewhere. We're just chilling, right? We're just waiting on the food. We're chilling. We're enjoying a nice time together. And my mom and sister are doing what they do amazingly is cooking the food and getting it ready. And oftentimes, when the food's ready and things are done, I just remember my mom, you know, screaming something out to us, you know, like, dinner's ready! And that sweet voice of hers. She's so sweet. She's here today. I'm not going to tell y'all where where they are, but they're in here. And so she yells it out, dinner's ready. And then my dad or somebody will just be like, one minute, wait one minute. You know, it's just this back and forth of, Dinner's ready. One minute, back and forth. And I'm like, just, you know, it's just a picture I have in my mind. And, you know, the guys would not want to sit down until everything is placed on the table. Every silverware is there. Every napkin, every dish, every plate, all the drinks are poured. The ladies are seated. And then we can sit down, right? Because we've got to watch this play or we've got to do this or that. We can't, we, we're going to wait until everything is there, right? Now, the kingdom of God is not like that. We're not awaiting anything to be placed out. We're not waiting till the last minute. We have the ability to respond to it now and to live in that framework now. The kingdom is here for you. V groups, our area of of connection at Vintage, are available for you as well. V groups are available. And we have these sheets. We, We have them out every single Sunday out in our connect area. It's very simple. It's not rocket science, right? On this sheet is every V group leader, every address, every email address, and when they meet. I don't think we can make it more clear, right? And so we have that ready for you. We have incredible leaders put in place all around the city. We'd love to connect you with a V group, but everything is available. Before we go further, we have to recognize that, that everything is available that you need in Christ. You're not waiting on anything. Point number two. 
Point number two, the choice is ours. The choice is ours. Verse 18 through 20. Verse 18 through 20. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field. I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen. And I go to examine them. Please have me excuse. Another said, I've married a wife. Therefore, I cannot come. The servant came and reported these things to his master. Excuses, excuses, excuses. Three excuses here. What's the first one? Possessions. Possessions are the first excuse. Verse 18. The first said to him, I've bought a field and I must go examine it. I've bought this. It's mine. It's my possession. I'm grabbing hold of this possession. Now, let me just say, possessions are not bad. If you don't have possessions, that's the way you live your life is the things that we have. Helps us live our lives the way we should be living them. But when those possessions take idol over the kingdom of God and our relationship with Jesus, that's when it becomes sinful. And so possessions can be an idol. Easily. Easily. The second one, is work. Verse 19, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I must go examine them. In this situation, in this context, working the field, keeping things in order, keeping the animals in order was an occupation. And so this guy had to go out and tend to his oxen first. Work is a huge idol, I think, for so many people. The grind and just getting caught up in our identity can easily become in our job. When really it's just a job, it's not something that can identify you and give you true purpose. But Christ, through His purpose for work, gives you purpose. Colossians talks about whatever you do, work as you're working for God, not for man. And so when you go to work, you need to be working 110%. Laziness is not biblical whatsoever. Work is biblical. But when work becomes your life, That's a sin. That's a sin. But when you use work as an avenue for ministry and glorifying God, you're on the right track. The third excuse. Relationships. Relationships. Verse 20. Another said, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. Okay, I think everyone in this room can relate to relationships. doesn't matter if you're married, single, young, old. It doesn't matter. Everyone has a relationship that they, they just love and they, 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 they grasp it and they hold it closely and, and dearly. And that is also a gift from God, right? Relationships, because we're made to be in connection with others. But when relationships take the place of the Savior, that's sinful. People cannot be your Savior. Just look at yourself. You are a person. You are sinful, redeemed by the grace of God, but you are not a Savior. You will let somebody down, and somebody will let you down. And so people cannot be your God. So what are your excuses today? Is it it work, distractions, peer pressure, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, a wife? Is it your family? Is it a hobby that you love to do? Is it your pride? Are you addicted to something? Are you selfish? Are you ignorant? Are you arrogant? Are you obsessed with your stuff? Are you obsessed with sports? What is your excuse? We all have an excuse. I made excuses, and I still, we all struggle with that every day. It's never going to go away, but the key is, how do you combat those excuses? When I was in high school, I grew up in a Christian home. Such a great uh, model of marriage and of just living the Christian life, an incredible church. But I gave my life to Christ at a young age. But when I got to that, that, that junior year of high school, all the way up to that freshman year of college, I really coasted. I really put Christianity to the back burner and lived a double life. And I did a really good job of hiding just a lot of things, just a lot of sin and a lot of stuff that I just, just, just kept to myself. And it was grieving the Holy Spirit inside of me. I was a believer. I was heavily convicted. But I didn't act on that conviction until I got to college. And God really took hold of me and drew me to himself and sent me out. But that was not a fun journey. And so excuses are so easy to make. So easy. Excuses. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 
Verse 23 says this, Paul writing to the church of Corinth, Christians, he says this, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build us up. Now what does that mean? It means everything that you want is available to you, period. I mean, we're in New Orleans, you know? I mean, there's a lot of places we could live anywhere. We could live in the middle of nowhere and still find sin, but it's so easily accessible. And Paul says, hey, just because it's there sitting in front of you and it looks good, just because you're thirsty doesn't mean you need to drink it, right? Doesn't mean you need to, to, to run after sin just because it's there. It doesn't build you up. It doesn't help you as a Christian. It does no good for your life. And Paul says, resist those things. Resist those. That's a battle for all of us every day. V groups, Adventist Church, our community, our connection, V groups are an intentional choice you have to make. You have to make the choice. And so many of you are already in V groups. Um, So many of you are already connected. Well, keep going. Keep leading. We need more leaders. But if you're not connected, Pastor Dustin oversees our equipping ministry. He could get up here every week and get on his knees and say, Join a V group, please! And just cry and scream and just, We need more people. We need leaders. You know? I mean, we could easily just get emotional and get, man, we're desperate. (laughs) Hey, but that's not genuine. We wouldn't want to do that anyways, would we, Dustin? Yeah. You have to make the decision. That is you acting according to God, leading you, being obedient, taking one step in obedience. Why should you make this choice? Let me give you two reasons. Why should you make the choice to be in connection with others? Two reasons, relationship and care. Relationship and care. That's the core of our groups, of our community. Relationship with other people, surrounding yourself with Christians to live life of accountability, transparency, and real life together. I mean, really getting real with each other, living a healthy Christian life. What is care? Uh, Does anybody ever have car problems in here? Anthony Freeze, thank you. I'm sure there's much more. (laughs) Um, This is as simple as me picking up Dustin because his car won't work and taking him to two different car shops that happened a week ago. It's care. It's meeting a need. It's it's humbling yourself and, and meeting a need of someone else and caring for them practically. So the kingdom is available. The choice is ours. Number three. The invitation is open. The invitation is open. Check out verses 21 through 24. It says this. The servant came. He reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry. And he said to his servant, Go out quickly. Go to the streets and the lanes of the city. Bring in the poor. Bring in the crippled. Bring in the blind and the lame. The servant then said, Sir... What you have commanded has already been done. It's already been done and there's still room. There's still room. The master said to the servant, Go out then to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. I want to focus on one verb. There's so much we could do with this passage I wish we had time to break it down a whole lot more, but I want you to get this one thing here in this, in this passage. Verse 23, compel. The verb compel. Now, this is not some chill, lazy, casual verb. This is a very active, aggressive verb. What does this verb mean? In the Greek, it has several meanings, but it means to, to urge, to insist, and to press. To urge, to insist, and to press. That shows me that Jesus has a heart for evangelism, right? It doesn't stop here. Actually, from here it goes out. And so Jesus uses this verb compel, compel to... Now, this doesn't mean, this is not what it means. It doesn't mean you grab your Bible, you find somebody, and you hit them, and you say, you need to go to church. That's not compelling. Compel is a love. Compel is a genuine care. And so if you have somebody in your life that you know is not a a Christian, 
It can be as simple as you inviting them to a gathering, as, as simple as you inviting them to our V-Group's relaunch party, coming to a group. I mean, just bringing them to a place where they will be loved and cared for and not judged and not condemned. This is an equal place here. Bringing people, compelling them, pressing in, giving the invitation, and letting them be invited. Compelling. There's two examples here of categories of people getting invited. Two examples. The first one comes in verse 21. It's the streets and the lanes. The streets and the lanes. Go to the streets and go to the lanes. What does that mean? It's the Israelite outcast. Which in this context, the ones that were originally invited looked a lot different than these people. But Jesus says, no, I'm going to the lowest of the lows, the ones that look nothing like me, that might not have nicer clothes than me, might be missing a few teeth, right? Might just be looking like they've had a bad day. I'm going to those people and I'm bringing them into my feast. That's what my kingdom is for. Those that no one else wants to talk to. Light of Hope is an incredible example that we have here at Vintage of meeting those needs. The second category is highways and hedges. Highways and hedges. In verse 23, this represents the Gentiles outside of the city. Those that did not associate with Jews, that had nothing to do with each other. There was a hate there. And so Jesus says, let's break the system, let's bust it down, and invite those that you guys hate. Let the love of Christ fuel you to reach those that are not reached yet. Two categories there of invites. Verse 24 says this in Luke chapter 14. I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. We can't dive into that too much, but I do want you to know this. The famous theologian, Dustin Turner, says this. To reject community is to reject Jesus. Let that sink in for just a minute. To reject community is to reject Jesus. Because Jesus created community. He created this. this. This is his idea. This thing that we're doing right now, this is not just something we do in America. The church is universal and was created long before we were ever in mind. This is our avenue of worship and glorifying God. If you reject community, you might, that might not be your intention. I know it's probably not. But I want you to know the heart of Jesus is community. And when you surround yourself with community, you're glorifying God and the purpose He has for you in the church. I used to be a part of a, a group in Uptown, a V group in Uptown. And there's one guy that was invited by his girlfriend. He kept coming a few times. You know, I could tell he was very uncomfortable the first few times, which who wouldn't be, right? You know, I mean, you're new people. You're surrounding yourself. You're sitting there in a smaller group. He's sitting there. He's beginning to open up as the weeks progress. He begins to share prayer requests and confesses sins and all these different things. And by the end of this period, he's become a Christian. He's given his life to Christ. And he's getting baptized soon. That's one example of group life transforming someone's heart. We have a relaunch party coming up soon. I want you to take this. It's on your seat. I want you to know that in, in the invitation area, fee groups are an avenue for you to invite people. You might be wondering, how do I even go out and share the gospel with people? You know, we're helping you with this. Um, this is a, a Wednesday night, July 27th, in this room. We're going to break it down, set it up, have food, have a lot of fun. It's going to be a great avenue for you to bring somebody that's checking this stuff out. I want to encourage you to do that. It's an avenue for invites. So our staff has been doing these workouts for about six months. And you're probably looking at me and thinking, wow, you work out? Um, a little bit, I try. Um, there's a guy in our church, he's an incredible resource. His name's Nick. Nick's a personal trainer, and, and he's, he's ministering to so many people in our church through the area of health and fitness. Um, he does workouts here at the church, you know, a couple days a week, and he coaches other people. He's going to coach a, a team at a high school. But Rob, our pastor, about six months ago noticed that we were all pretty out of shape, right? And uh, as a pastor, I appreciate that, him looking out for our health. Um, it's so easy to just let things go and forget about taking care of yourself. 
Anybody can do it. And so he recognized we need to take care of ourselves. And so Rob reached out to Nick, and, and they made a deal. And now Nick is coming in once a week, every Wednesday at 1 p.m., to lead our staff in workouts. I wish you could see it. It's very entertaining. <laughs> this past week, it was just me and Dustin. And so we had a great time out here in the lobby, uh, getting away from the heat, doing some workouts. But, but I say that because I want you to know that there's no way I could do workouts like that by myself. I go into the gym, and I made this joke in the 9 a.m. I actually didn't realize it was a joke, but I said, I go into the gym, and I do pull-ups with dumbbells. <laughs> Those are two completely opposite things, right? <laughs> Nothing to do with each other. I didn't mean to say that in the 9, but now it's just funny. i got to say it again. <laughs> Without a guide and, and someone instructing me, I don't know what I would do. I can run all day. I can do cardio and play golf and walk 18 holes and and run a few miles, but when you put weights in front of me, it's like I'm in a foreign country. And so Nick has really encouraged me and encouraged our staff to be in community with each other through health and fitness. But without Nick, without each other doing this together, I'd be lost. I'd be in terrible shape. I want you to know that without the kingdom of God, without connecting into God's kingdom, you will be lost, you will not grow, and you will not benefit the blessings of God that he has for you and experience life to the fullest. I want to pray for us, and then we're going to go into a time of response. So let's pray together. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, we're so thankful for who you are and for your heart. Your heart for us, God, is so consistent. God, there's nothing that we can do that will take away the love you have for us. Just just the other day, I'm sure we all can think of ten sins we committed against you. But Lord, your grace is new every morning. And every day your mercies are brand new and you love us. You sent your son Jesus to take on the sacrifice that we could not take. And today, God, as we Think about connection and the community of the kingdom of God at Vintage Church in this city as a Christian, as an individual. Lord, we need you. We need you. We think about everything that happened this week. And God, the tragedies of this week, we're broken. God, we are devastated. But we know that your kingdom is here. And it it provides hope. It provides an avenue of love and light in the dark. God, this world needs you. The church needs to rise up now more than ever. And so, Lord, would you just compel us to act today according to the way that you lead us? I pray for salvation today. I pray for uh, just refreshing uh, experience of your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.